Welcome back. Now, Eskom is exploring the implications of the withdrawal of the U.S. NRC approval for Westinghouse and uh, what is needed to enable them to continue supplying uh, fuel and components to Eskom's uh, Kuburg plant near Cape Town. Now, the agreement for cooperation in uh, peaceful uses of nuclear energy between the U.S. and South Africa uh, had, did expire for Westinghouse on the uh, 4th of December. And according to Eskom, uh, Westinghouse and Francis Framatome have been maintaining and uh, they've maintained um, a nuclear fuel supplies to the plant and uh, the Western Cape High Court meanwhile also last week ruled that Mineral Resources and Energy Minister uh, Gwede Mantashe's axing of anti-nuclear activist Peter Becker from the National Nuclear Regulators Board was unlawful. So to take a look at uh, these latest developments and try and unpack some of these issues related to uh, the nuclear power plant at Kuburg, we joined uh, via Zoom by anti-nuclear activist and uh, Kuburg Alert Alliance member Peter Becker. Peter, thanks so much for being with us here on Morning Live. Welcome to it. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. So let's just start with that met, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, Western Cape uh, High Court matter that directly affects you. So what has uh, transpired since the High Court ruling by Judge Amantame? Well, the ruling was quite definitive um, and the judge used uh, quite strong language to uh, rule that the axing was unlawful, as you said. Um, she used words like uh, it boggled her mind and it was uh, unsustainable allegations. And not only was the process uh, unfair, she said the minister bent over backwards to, to rush the, the thing through, but also that there was no misconduct on my part. So it was not justified that I was um, uh, dismissed from that position. And just in terms of having a board talking about nuclear and somebody who you've introduced me as an anti-nuclear activist, I think having a diversity of opinions on a board like that is only positive. Um, so I was very happy to be there and I was very happy with the ruling and looking forward to resuming my duties and going back to um, working with my fellow board members. Um, but I have heard subsequently, we've been notified by the attorneys for the, the NNR that they intend to appeal the ruling. So this means that it's another maybe um, um, a year that the whole appeal process could take to unfold because first they'll ask for leave to appeal and I think that'll be refused and then they'll petition the court directly and so on. And I only have 18 months left to my term. So that's going to be um, uh, quite a blow to the whole process in, in my view. And also I was there on the board representing the concerns of communities. That was my role. So for the last year, there's been no, nobody fulfilling that position. And it looks like now for another year, there might be nobody who is representing the concerns of community on that board. So how would you characterize your tenure on the board of the National Nuclear Regulator, Peter? Well, it was on my very first board meeting, there was a complaint. There was a letter of complaint from ESCOM about me being on the board. And that resulted in a, a legal process, um, getting a legal opinion. And as the judgment said, uh, it was uh, rushed through and it was not done fair. And in fact, uh, there were um, the allegations of misconduct were baseless in the end. But during my interaction with people on the board, I found it very constructive. Uh, we worked with each other in a very respectful way. And I think it was useful to them because obviously I focused on Kubert for the last 12, 14 years, something like that during my activism. So I do have a certain depth of knowledge about the plant. And I would have thought that that would be welcomed. And in fact, that's what the ruling said as well, the, the judge. Montame said that they should uh, have been grateful to have my input on the board. So I found it very constructive, but clearly there were elements that were very unhappy with me being there and they uh, took steps to have me removed. And that was from my very first board meeting. Which elements and why? Because I was reading that uh, letter that uh, the board sent to Minister Mantashe in which they complained about your conduct, uh, which is I'm particularly interested in knowing from your perspective what the dynamics were like in those board meetings. 
Mm. So that letter was a big surprise to me, and it only was revealed through the court process. I'd actually asked for any correspondence that was sent to the minister to be shared with me, because I thought that was my right to see it. Uh, but that was kept from me until we instituted the court process. And then by, I think it's Rule 53, they had to re reveal the record of decision. And there we found the, that letter with those uh, allegations that I was very surprised at. Uh, you know, one of them was that I inundated them with questions. And I think when I looked through the record, I found that I'd asked three questions. So I'm not quite sure how that can be classed as an inundation of questions. And um, you ask why it was done. It's difficult for me to speculate what was going on in other people's minds. Um, but we are at a very, very critical stage of the Kubu life at the moment. And there's actually a public consultation process that's running at the, uh, right now, but remarkably few people know about it. So this is the last opportunity that the public is going to have to make their feelings known and to give input into the public consultation process before the NNR considers granting a 20-year extension to the Kuberg plant. So, and, and I wanted to start there because I, I needed to contextualize that, uh, you know, in terms of uh, who you are and uh, your tenure on the board of the National Nuclear Regulator and the fact that both the board, it seems, and ESCOM, um, you know, were not happy with your conduct during this time uh, on the board of the National Nuclear Regulator. And as you say, um, that uh, letter that was sent to the minister by the chairperson uh, basically speaks of uh, Mr. Becker's conduct and that it was in conflict basically with the work that the board needed to do. So if there's just a final word you'd like on that before we move on to what happened last week in terms of the reports that came out about Westinghouse. Thank you. Yes. So just to clarify, that letter was not seen by the board. That was uh, written by the chair and sent to the minister, and it was not shared with the board. And in fact, the legal opinion that was sent to the minister was also not shared with the board before it was sent to the minister. But in the court papers, it incorrectly stated that the full board approved that legal opinion and approved that it was sent to the minister with a letter that was really a very thinly veiled request to the minister to dismiss me. So the judgment was quite unfair, I believe, on the board because it criticized them for not behaving professionally and not managing the process well. But to be fair, a lot of the board, the majority of the board was not aware of that letter and uh, was not aware of that opinion. So I'm not, um, I don't have any bad feelings towards the board. Uh, I think that uh, they're, they're very ethical people there. And as I've said before, I would look forward to resuming my duties on the board and working with my colleagues there again. So moving on to uh, Kuburg and what's happening there currently, uh, do you think that we should be worried about uh, safety of the existing plant at Kuburg, especially as it approaches uh, the end of its design lifetime at this point as we speak? So because I'm in a situation now where um, I've actually, it's been ordered that I am still a board member, I'm currently still being excluded from, from resuming my duties as a board member. So I'm in a strange in-between situation. I have none of the benefits of, of being a board member, but I have all of the constraints. And as a board member, I would not comment in public about safety issues because those are the kind of things that should be discussed within the NNR. So um, I'm going to um, sidestep that question, if I may. Uh, well, then, um, is there anything that you are allowed to speak about um, at this point regarding Kuburg mm -hmm. and what's happening there? Sure, absolutely. Anything factual I can tell you about, but in terms of expressing my opinion as to is it safe at the moment, that's something that I, that I won't do in public. Um, what I can say is that at the Kuburg plant is a 40-year-old plant. It was the construction started in the 70s. Um, and, and it is now uh, being considered for extending its life by another 20 years. It is a, a plant that's particularly close to Cape Town, so that um, is something that I think it's important for people who live in the area 
to get involved with the public consultation. You know, often I hear a lot of complaining. South Africans love to complain and particularly about government and governmental decisions. But if you don't get involved when you are offered an opportunity to have your opinion known, then I think you don't have much of a leg to stand on to complain. So I think it's really important that people inform themselves about the application from ESCOM to extend the life and that they do get involved in the public consultation process and make their opinion known. That process started the around the 8th of January, and uh, I think most people missed the announcement because, you know, we were still recovering from New Year and on leave and so on. Uh, so, as I've said before, I'm very surprised how few people are aware of this consultation process and their last opportunity to have their say before this decision is made. And just finally, uh, with regard to the energy mix uh, that South Africa obviously is espousing towards uh, uh, resolving this energy crisis in the country, uh, Kuburg is, of course, an integral part of that. Uh, nuclear energy is an integral part of that. And um, as things stand at the moment, uh, again, you said you can't give your opinion, so this makes it quite tough. Uh, but in terms of what Kuburg is delivering at the moment, um, should that obviously continue beyond uh, the lifespan of this particular power plant? So just to be clear, it's on the safety issues. I'm not going to share my opinion here, but on the desirability of the plant, that's a different subject, and I'm free to speak on that. So um, Kuburg actually contributes quite a small amount to the energy mix. Uh, at the moment, one unit is down, so it's um, one point something percent that it's contributing from its one remaining unit that's running. When both units are running, the nominal capacity is about three and a half percent of the country's electricity. And if we look at what's going on at the moment, in order to extend the life, one unit is being taken offline for six months and each unit is about a thousand megawatts which is equivalent to one stage of load shedding so by taking the unit offline ESCOM have added one stage of load shedding to the situation in the country because we're in permanent stage two or stage three load shedding. And their plan is now in September approximately to take the other unit offline for another 180 to 200 days, approximately six months. And that's going to add again a stage of load shedding that's unnecessary. So what we've been advocating for for quite a long time, and I see that several um, well-known experts are saying the same thing now, is that we should not have taken Kubrick offline, that we don't need it after 2025 what we do when we do need it is right now so Kuburg in in my opinion should be left running and we should use the electricity we should mitigate one stage of load shedding right now and we should focus on building new capacity as is happening there's a determination for about 13 gigawatts of renewable energy out and we know the cap has been lifted so individual private companies can build as fast as they can their own generation capacity and wheel that electricity via the grid and I believe that that will mean that by 2025, we won't need Kuburg, we won't need nuclear power and okay. all the complications that come with it, such as the fuel and this license that's been withdrawn now and so forth. Well, we'll leave it there for today. Thanks so much for your time. Anti-nuclear activist and Kuburg Alert Alliance member Peter Becker uh, helping us to unpack and make sense of some of the latest developments regarding the future operations of the Kuburg Nuclear Power Station.